truly an incredible chapter. It gives us an uh, Old Testament overview, all the way from Genesis chapter 1, story of creation, all the way to the end of 2 Kings, with God's people being led into exile in Babylon. And these are the returned people, the remnant of God's people who have returned from Babylon, who are praying this prayer after what we saw in chapter 8. In chapter 8, we saw them listening to God's word being read, and they were given understanding as the word was explained to them. And firstly, we did see them weeping in chapter 8, but they were told, no, this is a time to rejoice. The joy of the Lord is your strength. And now finally, here in chapter 9, after great celebrations of God's faithfulness, they come to a point where they both confess and worship the Lord. And we'll see a great contrast in this chapter. I called the sermon I preached from this section, Fools Before a Faithful God. Please take some time to read the chapter for yourself and try and notice the contrast. There's a massive contrast between what we're told about God and what we're told about God's people. And that is the big thing that we see in this chapter. And we'll see how God has faithfully shown goodness and compassion and grace to his people over and over again, despite their ongoing rebellion. And this chapter also teaches us how to pray, how to pray prayer of confession and prayers of worship to God. And so before you dig in further, if you haven't done so already, take some time to pray that God would help you to see wonderful things about him in this part of his word. So we're told here in verse 3 that they spent a quarter of the day in confession and in worshipping the Lord. And we'll see the contrast uh, between them and the Lord God. Uh, They confess all the evil that they've done and they are worshipping God for all of the incredible things that we're told about God in this chapter. And I'm going to just go through quickly and highlight some of what we see. As I said, this is a big overview of the whole of God's Word. And what we see um, in these verses is they point us to Genesis uh, 1 and 2. Um, Then we are shown uh, the story of Abraham in these verses. So they're pointing us to Genesis 12 and 15. And then the next verses, verses 9 to 12, are pointing us to the story of the Exodus. So the early chapters of Exodus, chapters 1 through to chapter 15, where they've been rescued from Egypt. And then from verses 13 through to verse 15, um, they're covering mostly Exodus 16 to 20, where we see uh, the giving of the law uh, at Mount Sinai. Verse 16 through to verse 18 speak of the story we see in Exodus 32. So uh, the story of making the calf for themselves. And we see some uh, terrible attributes of the people contrasted with all we've seen about our Lord God. Verse 19 through to verse 21 Um, gives us the story um, of Numbers, Uh, but there's also Exodus uh, 33 in there. Um, So these chapters are following kind of Exodus, Leviticus, uh, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Uh, All of those are are the history being covered there. And then from verse uh, 22 to verse 25, we get the story um, uh, that we read in the book of Joshua. Uh, the conquest of the land, God in his goodness giving them uh, this beautiful land flowing with milk and honey. And that is sadly followed by the people's rebellion uh, that we see the, the judges cycle from verse 26 to 28. That really is the backdrop uh, to that section. And then from 29 through uh, to verse 31, or verse 30 actually, we see 1 and 2 kings are covered. So all the way from Genesis 
to 1 and 2 Kings where we see God's people are taken away into uh, Babylon uh, exile. So it's a massive part of the history of God's people that is covered here. And look at all the things that we are told about God. So we start here, you made, you give life. The God made everything, he is from everlasting to everlasting. You found Abraham's heart faithful. You made a covenant with him. You have kept your promises. You saw, you heard, you sent signs. You made a great name for yourself. You divided the sea. You hurled the enemies into the sea. You led your people with a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then at Sinai, you came down. You gave your law. You made known the Holy Sabbath and your commands. Then you gave them miraculous bread from heaven. You gave them water from a rock. You told them to go and take possession of the land that you had given them. So in this we see God is giving and giving and giving. He's giving a covenant. He's giving a rescue. He's giving his law. He's promising them a good land. He's giving them bread from heaven and water from a rock. God is just giving and giving and giving. Before we look at the contrast that we see, which comes in here at verse 16, we're just going to see everything that we're told about God first. So we're told here that he is a forgiving God. Um, he didn't desert his people. He didn't abandon them. He gave his good spirit. He didn't withhold manna from them. He gave them water from a rock, just reiterating what we're told there. He sustained them in the wilderness for 40 years. He gave the kingdoms and nations to them. He made them, their children, as numerous as the stars. The promise that he had made to, to Abraham, the covenant he had made with them, was coming true. He brought them into the land that he had promised them. He subdued the people. He gave the Canaanites into their hands. And then here we see the amazing land that they were given. Um, houses and cities and vineyards and fruit trees and olive groves. God just gives and gives and gives. And then in this terrible judges cycle here, we see that um, even though they rebelled, we're told that God delivered them. God heard them. And then again, God heard them. God delivered them. And then getting towards the end of the Old Testament history, uh, just before the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, you warned them. You continued to be patient with them. You warned them. But then eventually you gave them into the hands of the neighboring peoples. But thankfully that's not the end of the story because you did not put an end to them. You did not abandon them. For you are gracious and compassionate. And again we see you have remained righteous. You have acted faithfully. You gave. You gave. God just gives and gives and gives. And one of the key things uh, that we see in all of this is that he is a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. That great Old Testament um, chorus that comes up a number of times through the Old Testament, great compassion, your compassion, your great mercy, you are gracious and a merciful God. So it is an absolutely incredible picture that we are given of our faithful God. But we're told right up front that these people are in sackcloth and dust on their heads. They're fasting. So they are in a, they're showing their penitent attitude and they are together to confess their sins 
and the sins of their ancestors. So this is a prayer of confession. They cried out with loud voices to the Lord their God, uh, which is uh, reminiscent of what we hear in Exodus 2, verse 23. The same words are used. It's the same kind of words used in, in Judges as the people cry out. So it's that same attitude that they are crying out, realizing what a terrible situation that they're in. And they're crying out because they have, for the last 24 days before this, they've been reading God's Word. And it's clearly given them a great picture of who God is and what God has done. But it's also given them a humbling picture of who they are and what they have done. They speak of their ancestors and say that they are arrogant, stiff-necked. They did not obey God's commands. They refused to listen. Those are terrible words. They had experienced all of God's ongoing goodness to them, and yet they continually turned away from Him. They committed awful blasphemies. But then in spite of all of this, because of the Lord's great compassion, He continued to give and give and give. He gave them incredible, incredibly good things. But then we get to verse 25, and we're told that they ate their full and were well nourished and reveled in your goodness. Now that can sound quite good, quite nice, but actually the Hebrew words used are very negative words, and particularly this word, well nourished, um, in the Hebrew is is the word to grow fat and it's used in Deuteronomy uh, 32 verse 15 uh, to describe how Jerusalem uh, or Jeshurun which is symbolic of uh, Israel have turned away from God um, it's used in Isaiah 6 verse 10 uh, to describe Israel's dullness it's described in uh, it's used in Jeremiah 5 verse 28, to speak of the judgment of God against Jerusalem. So when it says well-nourished there, it might sound like a nice thing, but it's actually showing how God's people have turned away from him. And we see here, flowing out of that, that they were disobedient, rebelled against you, they turned their backs on your law, they committed awful blasphemies. So the same thing repeated there. And then we hear of God's goodness. They cried out to you and you heard them. We see this uh, crying out a few times. Uh, back in the story of Exodus, they cried out at the Red Sea. Um, and then they cried out during the days of the judges and God heard them again when they cried out. You heard them. But they again did evil, what was evil in your sight. They became arrogant, disobeyed your commands, they sinned against your ordinances, they stubbornly turned their backs and became stiff-necked and refused to listen. So over and over again we're just given this picture. They paid no attention, they acted wickedly, they didn't follow God's law. They paid no attention. They did not serve you or turn from their evil ways because of our sins. So over and over again, these people are confessing all that they and their ancestors have done wrong. How they've taken God's goodness, His ongoing goodness, for granted. In God's compassion, He delivered them Time after time, there's this God's goodness and love and mercy and grace and compassion are shown just over and over and over again. And in spite of that, these stiff necked people continue to turn their backs. They pay no attention because they're sinners. Sinners before a holy God, sinners before a faithful God. And they know these people now, looking back over their history, know that the right thing for them to do is to confess their sins. Say, yes, this is who we are. Thank you. Thank you, God, that in spite of who we are, 
you remain gracious to us. We do see throughout this prayer how it is a mixture of both confession and worship, because they say we stand up and praise our Lord. They, the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are Lord. Your promises, you kept your promises because you're righteous. You saw our suffering and they worshiping him for the fact that he, he kept on seeing his people. He made a name uh, for himself, which remains to this day. These people, um, a thousand years after the events of the Exodus, are still worshiping him for the name that he made for himself in those days. Um, they worship him because he spoke. And it's his word to them in their day that has fueled this worship of him. And he's a God who is faithful to his promises because he made their children as numerous as the sky, the stars in the sky. And this worship of God leads them to this point. Now, our God, our great, mighty and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love, don't let this hardship seem trifling in your eyes. So what they're saying here is, God, continue to show us your faithfulness, your compassion, your mercy, as you have always done. Um, they are worshipping God because he is a God who keeps his covenant of love. Another contrast that we see throughout this section is this idea where it says, um, you heard... Uh, but the people refused to listen. So that idea is contrasted a, a few times. I refused to listen, did not obey. Um, to a similar, from a similar Hebrew root. Uh, so God heard them, but they continued to not listen. They continued to disobey Him. And so it's just reinforcing uh, that contrast. Um, and then one of the key things that we're told about God is that he keeps on giving and giving and giving. Uh, so you, this word sent, is actually the same word that's used throughout uh, the rest of the passage for gave. So you gave signs and wonders. Uh, you gave commands. You gave bread from heaven. You promised to give them the land. So we see that God is a God who, who gives and he gives and he gives over and over again. What a great and faithful God. And a chapter like this should cause us just to slow down and thank God for his amazing faithfulness. If this takes us through the history up to the book of Kings. For us, this side of the cross, we get to look at the story completed, God's written word to us complete. And we see how God has been incredibly faithful. He's continued to give and give and give. And one of the key passages to see that is obviously the very famous John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. God just continues to give and give and give. And another word that's worth looking out for is this word but and two of the the buts that are used here but you are a forgiving God but what has God done forgiven being gracious compassionate slow to anger and abounding in love but in your great mercy you did not put an end to them and that also can point us to Ephesians 2 where we're told that we were dead in our trespasses and sins and then it says, but God, being rich in mercy, made us alive even when we were dead. So this faithful God who is faithful to his Old Testament people continued to be faithful. And the extent of his faithfulness in making a people for himself was seen on the cross where our Lord Jesus cried out, it is finished. And he finished the work of making a people for himself. And a chapter like this should make us just slow down and be thankful for who God is, for what he's done for us. So 
I really do urge you as you teach this to others, try and draw out the wonder of what we see about God in this passage. But don't forget to also highlight the fact that we are, just like the ancient Israelites, still an arrogant, stiff-necked people who don't always listen. And we need to say sorry for that. So this chapter should urge us to be a people who, who confess our sins. And so lead those who you teach to be specific about areas of their lives that they aren't living God's way. And then to bring those sins before God and to thank him that in his great mercy, he hasn't put an end to us. He hasn't abandoned us, but he's been gracious and merciful to us. And pray that by the Spirit, God would do a work in us, uh, transforming us so that we will be a people who, who are less arrogant and stiff-necked, a people who really want to listen and a people who really want to obey. As Jesus said, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything I've told you. We should be a people who are increasingly obedient to God. So let's be praying that as we stand in wonder of who God is, that that will be a reality for us.